This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Lewis Harrell, assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Lewis as he continues teaching through God's Word. some things that we have to be mature enough to understand that Satan plants certain things in the church or uses people to do certain things to cause a division, especially if it's a good work, especially if it's a good work. He's going to send somebody or something to try to cause a division in the church to sow seeds of discord contentions and being dissensions and all those kind of things, those things are not of God. It's tempting to ignore the schemes of Satan, even when we know that he's up to something and keeping us away from the presence of the Lord, we still choose to remain ignorant. Pastor Lewis urges you to turn and run from sin in today's session. The more you dance with the devil's lies, the quicker you'll be right back in the hole you dug before meeting Jesus. Keep your witness pure and choose to serve the Lord day in and day out. Sacrifice yourself just as the blood of Jesus was shed to wash you clean. Now here's Pastor Lewis in Titus chapter 3 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. If you could turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Titus. We're going to finish up Titus and um, preferably we're going to move into the book of Colossians. So um, first we're going to start and finish up the book of Titus, going to verse 8. We're going to start at verse 8 there, okay? So as we finish up the third chapter of the book of Titus, we start there at verse, we pick it up at verse 8, and just simply says, this is a faithful saying. Now, let's see what he's saying is, is, is the faithful saying. Now, he's talked about a number of things. He talked about the washing of regeneration, which was one of the last things that he talked about. And as we mentioned, what the washing of regeneration was actually a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit, that he actually cleanses our, our, our sins, he forgives our sins, and not only that, but we are changed from the consequences of those sins. And it's a supernatural act. It's nothing that is done through labor. And we also talked about the fact that there are the, uh, uh, th- that, that Christ, you know, having been justified by grace, we are justified by the grace of Jesus Christ, just as if we had not sinned. So those things are taken off the table for us when we are in Christ Jesus. We have security in salvation, uh, and that we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And that is the That is the end of our salvation, is eternal life with Jesus Christ forever and eternity. So but we go from there and we go to verse 8. He said, now this is a faithful saying. In these things I want you to to constantly, not every now and then, but I want you to constantly affirm that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. What a powerful verse there. He said that those of us who are in Christ Jesus and who believe on Christ Jesus, those who believe in God, that they should be careful. That means be intentional to live our lives in good works, to be intentional about that, to to, to, uh, take every opportunity that we have to show good works, The Bible says we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We should take every opportunity to be that ambassador, to represent the kingdom of God for Jesus Christ here in the earth realm. Every opportunity that we get. And he said it's a faithful uh, faithful saying. I want you to constantly affirm this, that it's important that we have good works, maintain good works. And that maintain good works jumps out at me because he's not saying, I just want you to do these things every now and then. You know, do it when someone's watching. Do it when you're trying to impress somebody. Do it, you know, he's not saying do it when you're trying to uh, uh, deceive somebody because there's something you want. But he says, maintain good works. Every day that we get up, let us maintain 
good works. And it works in us. That power works in us. And that's what we should pray for. Lord, fulfill me. You know, fulfill your word through me this day. Let the power work through me to produce good works. Let me be a blessing to somebody. Let me be a blessing to somebody. Not just myself. I want to be a blessing to somebody else. Maintain good works. And then he said, these things are good and profitable to men. As we have always mentioned that our ministry is never for us. It's for others. The gifts that you have is not for you. It's to bless others, particularly in the church. But it's also a demonstration to those who are outside of the church that demonstrates that God is real, that Jesus is real. And we do that through the way that we live our lives, through good works. It's profitable. It's profitable to men. Now, and then he hits him with a big one here. Now, he talks about what we should do, and now he's going to change gears a little bit and talk about what we shouldn't do, what we should avoid in the church. And then look at verse 9. He says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogy, contentions, and strivings about the law. Let me just quickly say that what Paul is is saying here is that there are some things that we have to be mature enough to understand that Satan plants certain things in the church or uses people to do certain things to cause a division, especially if it's a good work, especially if it's a good work. He's going to send somebody or something to try to cause a division in the church to sow seeds of discord. Contentions and being dissensions and all those kind of things, those things are not of God. Those things are of Satan. They're works of the flesh. According to Galatians 5, those are works of the flesh. And anything that's a work of the flesh causes confusion. And we know that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So he says, avoid foolish disputes. Those things that we spend time talking about that have no eternal value, no eternal value, but just arguing about it just for the sake of, I want to be right. So I'm going to express and I'm going to continue to press this point because I want to be right. These things cause problems. These things cause problems. It can stumble people when we do things like that. So he says, avoid those things, avoid genealogies. You know, there's, you know, they're, 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 you know, back at that particular time, there were people who would use their, their, their bloodlines to try to distinguish how important they were. Well, I'm a Levite, and I'm this, and I'm of the seed of they, Abraham. He said, those things aren't important. Forget genealogies. My bloodline is not important. I'm born again. <laughs> So, so the only bloodline I'm concerned about is Jesus Christ and his blood that he shed for me. That's the only bloodline that's important. But he says, for, you, know, you know, don't stress and don't get in these arguments about genealogies. It doesn't matter. Those things are not important. And those things are a matter of pride. Contentions and strivings about the law, arguing about details about the law, not the righteousness or unrighteousness, but just these little small details. Now, there are times that we can get into discussions about the word of God, and we should. We should get into discussions about the word of God as we both seek the truth of the word, to rightly divide the word. And in and, 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 and our effort to do that, we can get into discussions, but those discussions should not turn into debates, and those debates should not turn into arguments, and those arguments should not turn into contentions, and those contentions should not turn into divisions. And unfortunately, that's what can happen. So he says, you know, avoid those things, for they are unprofitable. He, we already talked about what is profitable. What was profitable was good works. Being an example for Jesus Christ, that's what is profitable. But he said what's not profitable are these foolish disputes and arguing and, and these contentions. He said unprofitable, not only that, but they're also useless. What are they used for? They have no eternal value whatsoever. And then, in verse, then here in verse 10, he says, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition. So after we, you know, after you have a, a sit down with someone, the first time and you 
uh, point out to them how it's offensive, how they're, they're, they're causing an offense or they're causing a, a division by doing these things. That's the first time. And then the second time, you may bring someone else and say, listen, you know, we, we really want to bring to your attention that you're being divisive, you know, with these arguments and, and with these debates and things of that nature. Well, he said after the first or second time, if that person doesn't turn, if that person doesn't change, if that person doesn't see it, he said, reject that person after the first or second admonition. And this is the reason why. Look at what it says in verse 11, knowing that such a person is warped. That means they have, they're, they're, they're perverted, they're twisted. The enemy has deceived them. And they're taking the word of God and they're perverting it. They're twisting it. They're taking it to be something that is not truth. That person is warped. They're twisted. They're perverted and sinning. It's a sin to do what they're doing. Because they're, they're not just doing it because they're looking for truth. They're doing it because they just want to be adversarial. And he said that is sinful. He said being self-condemned. And then he's basically saying there that this is a person that you just have to reject. Now, to reject a person like that doesn't necessarily mean that you never minister to that person again. But there needs to be some church discipline where that person knows you cannot be this kind of, of a problem in the congregation. You cannot be this kind of problem in the congregation. So you treat that person as an infidel almost. You treat him as someone who's not even in the faith, and you minister to that person. You continue to show love to that person. You continue to deal with that person like you would any other unbeliever. And then in verse 12, he says, when I sin, that he's, he's finishing up this, this portion of it, finish, uh, finishing up the book of Titus. He says, now when I send Art, Artemis to you, or Tychus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. Paul was in the complex because this is coming around the time of winter. In fact, he even says here, for I have decided to spend the winter there. And that's pretty common because Paul didn't want to travel by sea in the winter because it was dangerous. So he would always find some place to winter. That means some place that he would be in to remain over the course of the winter until the, the seasons change and it's more safe. It's a lot more safer to travel over the sea so he can continue his ministry. So he said, send him, when you send that person, send him to Nicopolis because that's where I'm going to be for the winter. And then he said, send Zenus, the lawyer. Wow. One of the rare times you hear about somebody wanting a lawyer to <laughs> fellowship like this in the word of God. He says, send that lawyer. Apollos on the journey with haste that they may lack nothing. Now, a lot of the time, now Paul understands that there are obviously, you know, there just like there's anything else. You know, there's good and there's bad, there's evil, there's wicked, and there's righteous. Just like anything else, all, obviously all lawyers are not bad. We know that. I was actually considering being a lawyer at one particular time. All lawyers are not bad. What, Paul is, what we see is that there can always be a life-changing experience in Jesus Christ through the, through the gospel. All accountants not bad, but yet they considered those who were the uh, tax collectors, you know, they were bad. They considered them to be bad people, but they changed. Matthew changed. And we definitely always want to consider the life-changing power of God in anybody's life, regardless of what they do. We always want to consider that. So Paul says, send a lawyer. Maybe this is a person at one particular time was against the gospel. But now, maybe they are a help to Paul in the gospel. There are many people that have been like that for Paul in his life. There are people who will be like that for yourself. And he said, then Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let, verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works and to meet urgent needs that they may be not, that they may not be unfruitful. So he's saying when they leave you, make sure that they have everything they need. That's a good word. Now, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the Cretans who were very self-centered people 
who were a pagan nation, and they really didn't care anything about anybody else but their own satisfaction. But now that they're in Christ Jesus, Paul is saying, this is a way of showing good works. Make sure when they leave, they have everything they need. Everything they need. Be hospitable to them. What a word to the church today. Be hospitable to people. To bless people. To meet needs of people. Isn't that the church? To meet the needs of people. And however it is that they can be done. Meet the needs. Sometimes meeting the needs of people could be financial. Sometimes it could just be labor. Sometimes meeting the need of people could just be a phone call, a conversation. Somebody who just need to talk to somebody. Got to relay somebody on your mind and you call that person and say, oh, can't believe you called. I was just thinking about you and there's so many things on my mind, on my heart. And God sends you to call that person. And you become a blessing to that person because you become that listening ear. You become, sometimes it's not even necessarily to say anything, but just to listen. To be a blessing to someone who needs it. So Paul said, make sure you meet the urgent needs that they may not be, that you may not be unfruitful. He's trying to teach a, a city who was rooted in paganism, rooted in unrighteousness, immorality, and he's now saying, I want you, I don't want you to be unfruitful. Meet the needs of others. God is working in your life. What a blessing when we see those kind of things happen, those turns. And then in verse 15, it says, all who, all who were with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. So we finished the book of Titus. And it's, 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 it's important that we understand that this book of Titus is one of the three epistles, the, the pastoral epistles. And, and we, we didn't do it in order because it would be 1 Timothy, Titus, and then 2 Timothy. That would be the correct order that they were actually written. 2 Timothy was the book that was written right before Paul was executed. But 2 Timothy, this letter to this young brother, this young pastor, who Paul also considered to be a son. This young man, they received, him and Timothy received awesome instruction from Paul, who loved them and loved the churches that they were pastoring. What a blessing that is to see the heart of Paul poured out in these passages, but this is actually the Lord speaking through Paul. Not only to them, but also to us. The Lord speaking to them. What a blessing it is to even have these to be able to read. So we want to know about how the New Testament church works. We want to go to 1st, 2nd, Timothy, and Titus. This is Paul's message to the New Testament church. How it works, the function of it, the order of it. All of those things are there. So now we move into Colossians. And I, and I, and I have to say that I, I thought about going right to the next book, thought about going right to the next book, which would have been Philemon, if I would have went in that, in that order. But I, I, I was just not led to go that direction. Uh, Colossians was a book that kept coming into my heart to study, and I'm so glad that I did. So if you go over to the book of Colossians, and in chapter 1, just looking at um, the beginning of it, I just want to mention just a couple of things. First of all, Colossae, uh, this book, or this letter to the Colossians is actually the city of Colossae, which is a Roman city in the Asia Minor. It's about, it's about 100 miles east of Ephesus is where it's located. Uh, it's, just, it's a small city, and it's one of the three neighboring cities. Beside that is Laodicea, which we heard about from the, the book of Revelations. And also Hierapolis is one of the other cities. Uh, Colossae was a city who uh, was steep at one time, and very prosperous in trade. Uh, then there was an earthquake that hit. And when that hit, it devastated the city. Uh, they lost a lot of people, and they also lost a lot of industry that particular time. And that earthquake actually hit after they received Paul's letter. Paul had never been to Colossae. He didn't establish the church in Colossae, and we'll talk about who did in a minute. But Paul didn't establish that church. But yet Paul still wrote this letter <laughs> 
to Colossae, and he wrote this letter with such love and with such care and with such detail that you would think it was another church that he founded. But that's the love that Paul had for all believers, all believers. And we have to keep in mind, we're talking about a man who used to kill Christians, who used to lock Christians up. If you ever want to just know the life-changing power of the gospel, look at Paul. And then if you look at Paul, look at me. <laughs> and then right, probably look at ourselves, right? That's the power of the life-changing gospel. So Paul writes this letter to a place he's never been to a bunch of people he's never, ever met. But I want you to pay attention to the love and the care and the detail of it. So we start with verse 1 there in chapter 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. What jumped out at me immediately is that he talked about Timothy, our brother. Now, during this time that Paul wrote this letter, he was actually in, he was in jail. He was under house arrest in Rome when he wrote this particular letter. And you'll see a lot of similarities to Colossians and Ephesians, and we'll be referencing that quite a bit as we go through this letter. But he mentions Timothy as being with him. Now, Timothy wasn't in jail with him, but Timothy was there to assist him and to help him. Timothy was probably the one who scribed this letter as Paul was giving his words to it. And he says, Timothy, our brother. Well, we know that he called Timothy his son, but here he's just expressing the fact or stressing the fact that Timothy is a brother in the faith just like he's a son in the faith. The other thing I also want to mention is the fact that he calls Jesus, he mentions Jesus Christ, and he calls that together. Now, in all, pretty much all the epistles in his introductory, he mentions the name Jesus Christ. But if you were to just think about or go back through like the four Gospels, uh, you won't see those two names together. We know that Jesus' name, you know, that means, you know, save our people. And we know that Christ is actually his office. I mean, that's his position of authority. He is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the son of the living God. But you won't see those two together very much in the Gospels. Only about eight times you may see those things together. Peter was one who mentions that when he says, who, you know, who, who am I? Who does man say I am? Peter said, you, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. But you don't see that that often in the Gospels. And that's why Jesus was so quick to say, oh, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father who was in heaven, because Jesus didn't even really reveal himself as that as much in the Gospels. So he knew that it had to be spiritually reviewed or spiritually revealed to him. But here you see these names together, Jesus Christ. And you'll see that together in most, most of the epistles because by this time, those who are teaching and preaching the gospel are presenting Jesus as the Messiah. And when we preach and teach Jesus, we should do it as Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the true God, the, the, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And then in verse 2, he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks, and that's another thing you're going to see quite often throughout this letter, the giving of thanks and talking about thanks. And we talked about it before, that that's something that we should probably be more intentional about doing in our lives is giving thanks to God. You know, in our prayers, we should always take time to give thanks to God. You know, we, we always can go into talking about a laundry list of things that we need, and I sure need a lot of things. I need God to do a lot of things in my life as well, but we should always remember to thank Him for the things that He has done. We're so glad you joined us today on Living Waters of Grace, as Pastor Lewis has been walking us through the book of Titus. This New Testament letter was written to a young man named Titus, whom the Apostle Paul was mentoring and supporting. You see, along with Timothy, Titus was in a place of leadership during the early church era. He was instructed to appoint elders for the church, men who would make sure the teaching was sound and who would watch over the members. It's a great book for understanding how what you believe should be evident in your everyday life that what and who you believe God to be shows up in your actions and words. If you've enjoyed this message in Titus today and you'd like to hear more messages like this one, head over to calvarychapelonline.com. 
Just go to the Listen tab and you'll find more messages with insights from Scripture as Pastor Lewis shares God's truth from the Bible. If you live in or near the Greensburg area, we invite you to join us at Calvary Chapel Westmoreland each week for a time of worship. Directions and service times can be found at calvarychapelonline.com. If you can't make it in person, we're also streaming our services through our YouTube channel. For those who are on social media, you can find us on Facebook as well. Look for the links and more at calvarychapelonline.com. That's all we have time for today, but be sure to join us again for the next edition. Pastor Lewis will continue on in the book of Titus, providing some useful and applicable thoughts from this letter, so don't miss it. We're excited to connect with you again on Living Waters of Grace.